All right, first and foremost, I want to give all praise, honor, and glory to the Most High God, Yahweh, Bahashem, Hamashiach, Yahweh Shai. We're going to go into a uh, lesson that we was talking about. We had a class on last night in reading class, and uh, we was reading Second Chronicles chapter 25, and uh, it came into dealing with a man's intentions, and I want to actually go into this. The title of it is going to be, The Road to Hell is Paved with Good Intentions. The Road to Hell is Paved with Good Intentions. Are your intentions right with the Most High God? So, I wanted to read this because this is actually a same saying in the world. The saying is, The Road to Hell is Paved with Good Intentions. So, I want to read this in the um, Wikipedia. It says, A common meaning of the phrase is that wrongdoings or evil actions are often overtaken with good intentions or that good intentions when acted upon may have unintended consequences so okay go back going back up to the top top wrongdoings are evil actions are often undertaken with good intentions, right? I'm going to go drop down to uh, the other point it makes. It says, a different interpretation of, of the saying is that individuals, individuals may have the intentions to undertake good actions but never, nevertheless fail to take them. So someone may have good intentions to do it, to do something, but they never do it. Okay. It says, this an action may be due to procrastination, laziness, or other um, subsurvice vice. It says, as such, the saying is an admonishment, astonishment, admonishment, Salakia, that a good intention is meaningless unless followed through. This is considered, uh, this is cons uh, consistent with another saying, and this is another saying that goes with it. It says, the only thing necessary for evil to yeah, the only thing necessary for evil to win is for good men to do nothing. I'm going to read it again. The only thing necessary for evil to win is for good men to do nothing. All right? So when good men don't take action, they may have plans to take action, but they never do it. And that's how good wins. So, and we know none is good but one, and that is the Most High God. So he's the one who sends it and puts it in men's heart. As a matter of fact, let me go ahead and get this precept. <clears throat> this is 1 Samuel chapter 6 and verse 7. 1 Samuel chapter 6 and verse 7, it says, But the Lord saith unto Samuel, Look not on the countenance or on the height of his stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth. So he's saying, don't even look at his countenance or his stature or his height. Don't look at his appearance. Um, because the Most High God already refused him. He already didn't choose him. He already didn't choose somebody. So you might think coming into this troop, hey, this person might be the best person to be on the line, to be teaching. He got the perfect teaching voice. He got the best uh, explanation to, 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 to giving scriptures. Um, he's just well put together. That's and and the most high God, he doesn't use those men. And it's going to tell you what the most high God sees. A lot of people, they look on the outward appearance of someone or even like, um, the attributes that someone has, like I said, like as in speaking or, um, being well, real good with breaking down um, understanding of things. Uh, when I came into this truth, I knew 
I can't remember his name, but this guy um, I was introduced to, he was never with a camp, but he was, I mean, he made some fire videos. He made some fire videos. And uh, he's not even in the truth no more. He's like selling. He's all into business and stuff, like to selling and stuff. So, you know, the Most High God wanted to use him only for a time. And then, you know, he did what he had to do, you know. That's what the Most High God used him for. But let me finish this up. Actually, I'm going to start back over. It says, but the Lord saith unto Samuel, look not, look not on his countenance or on the height of his stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth. For man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. So the Most High God, he looks at the heart of a man, or the intentions of a man, right? The man's intentions, what he really plans to do, right? He's not a procrastinator on making sure things get done. Um, you know, he's not a procrastinator because procrastination is just laziness, right? Um, I had another definition I wanted to bring out. Uh, so lucky. Let me see if I can find it. Um, okay, so this is uh, because the Bible talks about provisions, making provisions, right? Um, and provision, it says, what is the real meaning of provision? It says arrangement or preparation beforehand. So that's a plan, planning, making arrangements to do something or preparations, right? And let me see if I can find that scripture real quick because I thought I had it ready. It's in the New Testament. Yeah, here it is. This is Romans chapter 13 and verse 14. It says, But put ye on the Lord, Hamashiach Yahweh Shai, and make not provisions, provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. So provision, you don't want to make plans to, to do something wicked. Like, uh, let's say you're smoking cigarettes. Like, uh, I just bought a pack of cigarettes. I'm not going to throw them away right now. I'm just going to put it up underneath my mattress and then just wait just in case I have that urge and I can't shake it. I, I know where it is. I know where the pack of cigarettes is. That's making provisions for evil, for the lust of the flesh. Right? This is just one example. I'm sure there's many other good ones. But that's just making provisions of the flesh. So you don't want to make plans or preparations to do wickedness. And we already know, looking back at the stories, that's what we did as a nation. So we had to fall and be retaught again. Um... But going back to the main point, main point is, is your heart right with the Most High God? All right, this is uh, Second Chronicles chapter 25 and verse 1. It says, Amaziah was 20 and 5 years old when he begot, when he begotten to reign. And he reigned 20 and 9 years in Jerusalem. And his mother's name was Jodine of Jerusalem. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, but not with a perfect heart. He did that which was sight which was right in the sight of the Lord, but not with a perfect heart. So he didn't do it with a perfect heart, meaning, you know, he kept the laws of the Most High God, he kept the commandments. But he didn't do it with a perfect heart. So your heart, your intentions, your your what you what what you're doing, like your attitude behind doing it is looked upon. The most high God is looking on your actions and he's looking at your intentions, your intent. Like, man, it say it say to go uh help a a brother if it's it's good to do good on the Sabbath. If a brother's ox fall in the ditch. Go help him. You know, you don't want to have the attitude, man, this brother, man, he, I can't believe him. You know, you complaining and murmuring and you got a bad attitude about it. And, but you did. But I did it, though. But I did it. That's that's the type of thing that the Most High God is looking at. Yeah, you kept the laws. But how did you keep the laws? 
right? Um, like uh, Officer Bahawam, he say, uh, not that we have to keep it, but we get to keep it. So that's the type of attitude you really want to have is that that's a pleasure. That's a privilege on um, being chosen. It's a privilege to get to keep the laws of the Most High God. So, yeah, it's going to be written down that you did it. But your intentions, your attitude behind how you did it is also going to be taken into consideration. It's going to be taken in more consideration than you actually doing it. You know, you having a perfect heart to the Lord. I'm going to read verse 2 again. It says, and he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, but not with a perfect heart. So his attitude, his mindset behind it, he didn't do it with charity. Charity, uh, a lot of people mistake charity for money. Um, charity wasn't didn't become money until the New Testament, so it didn't. It wasn't money. Uh, we already broke this down before. Money wasn't look at, looked as as charity, but it can be. But charity really, even though you do, even though you help somebody, let's say you give somebody a meal that needed it, if you didn't do it with the right attitude, it's still not counted as charity. So let's say a brother is, is begging and he's dying on the last leg, barely making it. And he needs something to drink. He needs something to thirst. Something to, yeah, you helped him. But, I mean, depending on the attitude, whether you just shoved a glass of water in his hand and half of the drink spilt out, you know, but he's still desperately drinking it, you know, that type of heart is going to be taken into account on the day of judgment. You know what I mean? Whether you gave it to him with joy in your heart. So I'm going to read this since I said it. This is Deuteronomy chapter 28 and verse 47. It says, because thou servest not the Lord, thy God with joyfulness because you didn't serve the Lord with what joyfulness and with gladness of heart for the abundant, uh, the abundance of all things. So you're supposed to serve the Lord, your God, everything that he told you, you're supposed to be doing right. Submitting one to another, men submitting to men, women submitting to their husbands. If you're not doing that with joyfulness and gladness of heart, you're not keeping these commandments with joyfulness and gladness of heart. Hey, it's all in vain at the end of the day. It's counted as nothing. So your your heart is going to be taken into consideration. Um, you know, you got to be doing it with a perfect heart. So that's something, this is an important message, Lord willing. It does edify uh, your brothers and sisters this point of trying to, you know, doing this lesson is that y'all can understand of keeping the commandments is one thing, but doing it with the perfect heart is another. So we, I don't want your actions to be labored in vain. I want you to make sure that everything counts, that you do it with all your might. That's why he says to do it with all your might, all your strength. Let me get it. Let me get it. <clears throat> all right, I'm already here, kind of. All right, so this is... Uh Ooh, wait a minute. It's a lucky. I thought I that wasn't the right. Alright. All right. It's Deuteronomy. I think it was Deuteronomy. Let's go to no, 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 no. It's lucky. All right. This is it. I thought it was Deuteronomy 5. It was Deuteronomy 6. All right. Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 5. It says, And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul. And with all thy might, right? It says, uh, and these words which I command thee this day shall be in thy heart. So you're supposed to do it with all your strength. And uh, a lot of people think that strength just means physical. No, it's talking about emotional, uh, spiritual, with everything that you can muster up. So it's not just talking about your physical abilities of doing push ups and squats. That's not what he's talking about. Like, you know, I'm going to do this. I'm going to pick up this speaker with all my might. That's not what he's saying. 
Um, you do it with everything that you have in you. Um, there was a, 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 I had ran across the Spartan saying, it said that if a Spartan comes back from a war, it's like a failure because he didn't give it, he didn't die in combat, something like that. I'm roughly paraphrasing Salakia, but it was something to long, along the lines of that. Uh, maybe one day I'll get it. But um, the meaning behind it is that you put forth all your strength. You put forth everything that you got. You don't try to hide uh, or hold back. Uh, actually, as a matter of fact, there's a scripture on that. I'm thinking about, I believe it's in the book of Jeremiah. Let me go ahead and just look it up because I know if I try to get it. Um, uh, all right, this is Jeremiah chapter 48 in verse 10. It says, Curse be he that doeth the work of the Lord deceitfully, and curse be he that keepeth back his sword from blood. So we know this isn't, you know, the Bible is spiritual. So it says, curse be he that holdeth, I'm sorry, that keepeth back his sword from blood. So spiritually, it's talking about you putting forth your strength. If you hold back from doing everything that you can to bring forth this kingdom, if you hold back, you, it says, curse be he, Right? Curse be he. So that's, that's a, it's a curse coming upon you because you didn't put forth all your might, all your strength to serve in the Most High God. You only did it half. You you did things half-ass, you know. So like you're from a French, but we know asses in the, you know, in the scriptures, a donkey, a mule. Uh, but the point of the message is, is that we got to put forth our strength. We got to bring forth, uh, forth joy like the fruits of the Spirit talk about. So we don't want to do the work of the Lord deceitfully, right? Uh, we got to have the heart, uh, a perfect heart. And we know who else had a perfect heart, uh, which was King David. And I'm going to bring that out. This is um, the book of Acts chapter 13 and verse 22. It says, and when he had removed him, he raised up unto him, unto them, David, to be their king, to whom also he gave testimony and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, which shall fulfill all my way, all my will. So not only that he just fulfilled the will of the Lord, fulfilled all his will, but he did it with a perfect heart. And what is that perfect heart that we're seeing that we're talking about? Doing it with joy, doing it with gladness. It says in Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 48, I'm going to read this again. It says, because thou servest the Lord, not the Lord. Because thou servest not the Lord thy God with joyfulness and gladness of heart and the abundance of all things, these curses came upon us. So you see joyfulness, you see fruits of the Spirit in the, the fruit of the Spirit in the Old Testament. You see him talking about joyfulness and, and gladness. These are fruits of the Spirit, right? This is the fruit of the Spirit that we're reading, that we're really talking about. So we got to have the fruit of the spirit when we do these commandments. It's much more, it's, it's better when we are doing it in the right spirit, when we're doing it in a right frame of mind, right? Lord willing, I'm getting through to this, through to y'all on this, on making sure y'all are keeping the laws with a good spirit because it is in vain if you're not. Now, let me read this warning. This is Jeremiah chapter three and verse 15. It says, and I will give you, oh, Salaki, this is before the warning, Salaki. Let me just, let me read this. This isn't the warning yet, Salaki. Jeremiah 3 and 15, and I will give you pastors according to mine heart, which shall feed you knowledge and understanding. So the Most High God in the last days is going to give us these brothers that's going to give us, that's going to feed us properly, that is according to his heart, right? Just like King David had, was, had the heart of the Most High God, right? There's the same men that are going to be up on earth. They're going to be following after these footsteps. They're going to have that heart. They're going to have that joy in their heart, putting forth their strength. It's not going to be done in vain. It's not going to be meaningless, right? We're not going to be doing it for filthy lucre, lucre or some other um, intentions behind 
our actions. We're not going to have like, I'm really secretly doing this because I heard that I can get another wife and I'm really trying to, that's not going to be their intentions. That's not going to be their heart. Their heart's not going to be doing that. We're going to be doing it with or without wives. We're going to be doing it with or without money. We're going to be doing it, right? And then most high, he's going to, then he's going to put us through to see if we really, you know, we're really about it. You know, a lot of men, you know, a lot of these men that are out there on the highways and byways, if not all of them, got stories to tell about how, uh, you know, sleeping in the car and didn't have no wife. My wife left me, my kids, you know, I mean, they have all kinds of stories, man. You know, so we, we're doing this not because of some worldly game. These preachers out here, they're doing it. These Christian preachers, they're doing this because of money. Are they doing this because they get tax exempt? Are they doing this for some other uh, fleshly reasons, um, um, carnal reasons? That's what they're doing it for. They're not doing it for the, the sole purpose of loving their people and loving the Most High God. That's not what they're out here doing it for. <coughs> This is Jeremiah chapter nine and verse thirteen. It says, "And the Lord, and the Lord set, uh, so like you. And the Lord saith, saith, because they have forsaken my law, which I give, which I set before them, and have not obeyed my voice, neither walk therein, but have walked after the imagination of their own heart, and after." By all are Balim, which their for I'm sorry, which their fathers taught them. So we have the same people that are up on the earth today. They're walking after their own hearts and after their own lust. They're not walking after the obedience of the Lord. So like yeah. Let me finish this out. Jeremiah chapter nine and verse thirteen. So like you. Okay, so it says, Therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, behold, I will feed them, even this people, with wormwood, and give them water of gall to drink. So he's gonna, you know, curses are gonna come curses are gonna come upon us. Because we're going after our own hearts, man. We're going after our own lust. We're doing this for our own selfish reasons and not for the way, not for how the Most High God told us to do. Not for how, not for what the Most High God, um, like he taught us how to love. You know what I'm saying? We, we think that we go on, we lean on our own understanding of how to love when he taught us how to love. He taught us how we're supposed to love. And we think we don't need to be taught how to love. I've been on this earth for 57 years, young man. You don't need to teach me how to love nothing. I've been knowing how to love. Well, according to the Bible, you don't know how to love. The Bible teaches us how to love properly. And we, as men, got to be um, understanding to lean on something greater than us. When we lean on something greater than ourselves, we learn how to become great ourselves. Right? Um... Something else I want to bring out. This is the book of Job, chapter 1 and verse 1. Now, you hear a lot of brothers going to this just to show how Job is perfect. And I'm going to get that. Therefore, it says, There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. And that man was perfect and upright. And one that feareth the Lord and, abs and obsued so like, yeah, evil. And obsued evil. Eschewed evil. Right? So... The point of bringing this out is that Job was righteous, meaning he kept the laws of the Most High God. Not only did he kept the laws of the Most High God, but he feared the Lord. He feared the Most High God. Um, I'm going to read this. This is the same chapter in the same book, Job 1 and 8. It says, And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and upright man? One that feareth God and absurd evil. So he feared, not only was he upright and righteous, not only was he keeping the laws of the Most High God, but he feared the Lord, right? That's another thing that showed that he was perfect and his heart was upright. His heart was right with God because he feared the Lord. He was obedient to the Most High God, even though he was around nations that were wicked, 
way wicked that was just crazy wicked he still feared the lord right by keeping the laws um let me show you another reason like another way of showing how job's heart was perfect i don't think a lot of brothers bring this out too much but this is job chapter 42 and verse 10 it says <clears throat> and the lord turned the captivity of job when he prayed for his friends also the lord gave job twice as much as he had before so why did the most high god turn the captivity of job because he prayed for his friends he um he kept the laws of the most high god it's love thy neighbor as thyself he didn't just pray for himself he prayed for his brothers and sisters right he prayed for those that feared the lord as well right um Let me get this. This is another way of showing how someone is not really serving the Lord thy God with a right heart. So you can be fasting, you can be praying, you can be doing all that you can be keeping the commandments and still not have a, a, a perfect heart with the Lord. <clears throat> this is Isaiah chapter 58 and verse 4. Behold, ye fast and strife and strife and debate and to smite with the fist of wickedness of wickedness ye shall not fast as ye do this day to make your voices your voice to be heard on high is this is it such a fast that i have chosen so this is saying that a lot of times when we fast and pray to the most high god we fast for to be a better debater to be a to be better at arguing to be better at, I want to, I want to fast to win a, a, a argument to show that I'm smarter than a brother, to show that I'm better, that I'm right. I have the right to be looked at as someone to follow. That's the ultimate. It's a selfish reason. Reason. It's a pride, right? It's not a, it's not a good reason to fast. They're fasting. They were fasting to, um, to win, to win arguments and debates. So that is not how we should be doing that's you know one another warning how we should, should not be um when we're coming to serve the lord we want to please the most high god with a good heart with a uh, uh perfect heart and the only way that we can do that is by having good intentions doing it with a good attitude attitude I, the, there's a saying in the world attitude is altitude right attitude is altitude and that's that's that has a truth to it. Your attitude uh, can dictate your altitude with the Most High God. If you come with the right attitude, right? If you're doing it just because you're told to do it, and you got a sluggish manner and attitude about it, and it's just ugly and it stinks, and nobody like nobody want to be around that, right? Um, your face is all distorted because you don't want to. I just don't want to do this, but I got to because I'm commanded to. That's not the right type of attitude, right? If anything, if y'all don't walk away to anything, man, walk away with that. It's the whole meaning of this lesson is to have the right type of attitude about keeping the laws of the Most High God. Not that you have to keep it, but you get to keep it. Have that positive attitude, man, and and, and that's going to take you far. Sometimes that type of attitude is going um, it's going to take time for you to actually achieve it, but that's something for you to work on. Because a lot of people might not think that they have anything to work on either. But you do. Uh, let me get this last precept. It's kind of long, but it's in uh, 1 Corinthians 13. I spoke about it earlier. But this is just to sum everything on up. Uh, this is 1 Corinthians chapter 13, and verse 1. It says, Though I speak with the tongue of, of men and of angels. Right? You're speaking with the tongue of men, and you got the Lashawam Kodash also. It says, and have, and have not charity, I am become as sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. So you're just making noise because you don't have charity. If you're not coming with good intentions, if you're not coming with the right type of attitude um, of really truly loving your brother and you wanting to see them strive and succeed and do better, um, you are become... As sounding brass, you are vain, you are nothing, you're just making noise. Verse 2 And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries 
and all knowledge, and though I have all faith, so that I could remove mountains, and have not charity, I am nothing. So let's take it back up to the top on verse 2. It says, and though I have the gift of prophecy, which is huge, right? You can break down this Bible, you can understand it, because we know the, that uh, prophecy ultimately, spiritually, is talking about Christ and how the works that he done, the testimony, and he comes in the volume of the book. And to be able to um, tell the, the, the forecomings, the events that's coming up on this earth, it says ultimately that I am nothing. But you can do all that. You can do all that. You can break down prophecy, break down the mysteries. It says, and understand all mysteries. All mysteries, brother? It say all mysteries. I don't know one person that got, I know brothers that got some good mysteries, right? They got some mysteries of the Bible, but it say all mysteries. You can understand all mysteries and all knowledge. And though I have all faith, all the faith, hey, it's a, it's a, it's a, uh, a meme about Chuck Norris. It's a, uh, Chuck Norris is like, you know, the, the ongoing jokes about Chuck Norris, like he's like unstoppable, right? It's, uh, it's mean. He says, uh, somebody asked Chuck Norris how many push-ups he can do. He said all of them, right? I remember uh, Officer Aharani brought that to the camp. That was crazy. That was funny. How many push-ups can you do? All of them. Man, come on, bro. All of them? I can do all the push-ups, right? But it's kind of like this. It's like, uh, though I have all faith, so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods and feed the poor, this is let you know it's not charity, it's not just about feeding the poor. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I have my body to be burned and have not charity, it perf uh, profiteth me nothing. So you burnt, your body's been burned and bruised and battered, and you go out there and make your body a living sacrifice, but you don't do it with a good attitude. If you don't do it with charity, I think charity needs to be spoken of a little bit more in the nation of Israel too, because a lot of people think charity is just doing something good, which that is a part of it. That's not all of it though. But if you're doing it without a good attitude, a good intentions, it says it is nothing. It profiteth me nothing. Right? You go out there and feed the homeless. You go out there and feed the poor every week. And you don't do it with a good attitude. It's nothing. Verse 4. Charity suffereth long and is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself. It is not puffed up. I'm going to jump down to verse 8. Charity never faileth, but whether there be prophecy, they shall fail. So what is it saying? There's going to be a point in time where all the prophecies is going to be done. There's going to come a point in time when Christ is going to return and all the prophecies has been fulfilled. Right? So charity never faileth, though. But whether there be charity, I'm sorry, but whether there be prophecy, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. So there's going to come a point in time where you got a lot of languages out here spoken. You got a lot of uh, different dialogues that are out here spoken on the earth. There's going to come a point in time where it's going to cease. We're all going to start speaking one language at one point again. Um, it says... Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. Salaki. Salaki, Salaki. Just a second. All right, I'm going to jump down. It says, but um, knowledge shall vanish away. But back at the top of verse 8, charity never fail. Charity never faileth. I'm going to jump down to verse 13. It says, And now abideth um, and now abideth faith, hope, charity. These three be the greatest. Of these is charity. It says to Slaki, but the greatest. I'm going to read that again. Slaki. It says, but now 
abideth faith, hope, and charity, these three, but, but the greatest of these is charity. The Bible says the greatest of faith and hope and charity is charity. That should tell you how much the Most High God loves charity, loves your attitude. When you come to the Lord to serve the Lord with a good heart, with a good attitude, that is having a perfect heart with the Most High God. All right? So, Lord willing, y'all brothers and sisters are edified. I want to get infinite honor, infinite praises, and infinite glory to the Most High God, Yahweh, Bahashem, Hamashiach, Yahweh, Shalom, Mabarak, Mashbukah.